uh, in NCR, Jaipur, Bhubaneswar, and other places. So that that is the panel that we have for you. Uh, okay, so I'll I'll start quickly with the first question for Mr. Tuteja itself. Mr. Tuteja, uh, keeping the current scenario in mind, uh, what kind of design changes in general do you foresee uh, coming after the lockdown, incorporating the social distancing and hygiene norms? And how do you think we should encourage a population of 1.3 billion people, where population density of cities like Bombay is over 32,000 people per square meter, square kilometer? Mr. Duteja. You've asked a very relevant question today, but as an architect, I think uh, we never visualize that there will come a time in our uh, design philosophy or in terms of when we are doing any designing that we would want to keep people at bay in certain aspects of our designs. And that's something we need to plan. And I think whatever I'm going to talk will be relevant to the buildings which have already been designed and completed as well as a factor which needs to be taken into account because it's becoming more relevant now because COVID-19 is going to be here for some time. And that's something I'll start off. When we are talking about social distancing, that's more on social front or at the community level. But when we talk about our building designs, I think I have come across uh, a term in the last two days that is uh, building distancing. Now we have to, I will give you numerous examples that why I'm saying the building distancing is necessary because there are many factors which happen in the building, which as architects, we never realized would happen in reality. But in the last 20 years, because of the accelerated economy in India, a lot of things were imposed in a building or in the interiors, which we never visualized would be subjected to. For instance, I'll give you an example that today in present scenario, if I talk about a commercial building of a medium size, you will have at least on a shell and core building concept, I'm not talking about one or two corporate uh, sharing a building. In that case, you will have about 15 to 20 tenants and every tenant will have about 15 to 20 courier guys coming in the morning till afternoon. And then again, the same phenomena happens in the evening. Those are the kind of visitors which are not desired in any building now because of the infection rate, because they will bring trouble for us they come into the offices and I think some of them even use the restroom facilities. So that translates into a kind of a design requirement, which we need to build in. We can't do it at the entrance lobby areas because ground floor areas of any building is very expensive in a commercial building. So we need to plan it that the future building should have a small area in basement where all these guys go and deliver the packets. So we are now talking about a virtual virtual delivery of couriers. So what would happen in that kind of concept that they inform the office and the office guys goes down and he receives the parcel. And mm. that is something which needs to be done so that we avoid getting them into the building. So that is one area which again establishes some kind of a requirement in, in our mind. And then the same thing should happen in the existing building. Now the second factor which you will see, like you go to Cyber Hub example, I'll take. You go to any building, they're tall buildings, very large uh, plate size. They have bank of eight to 12 lifts and you go, every lift has a lift attendant. He's sitting on a stool, he's occupying space. Do I need that? They are unnecessarily increasing the traffic load onto the lifts which we have. So if I discount those 10 guys sitting in 10 lifts, that means I can reduce one lift in my design factor, for instance. That would not happen, but he is a nuisance today in terms of COVID-19, and they need to be removed from there because as it is, lift is a very congested area. So these are kind of things which we need to look at in greater detail. Even at the entrance areas, we get a lot of visitors in every commercial building, every institutional building. How do we take care of them? We need to do thermal scanning. Okay, that's part of the facility management. It doesn't affect the designer, but somewhere along the line, before we let them into the lobby, we need to kind of create a empty room before the building so that they can be taken care. Because once they enter the building, 
we are already back to uh, zero ground that the infection has come in or whatever and we are necessarily trying to tax the existing security system okay and so on this point, there's one factor which i'll just uh, uh, emphasize on social distancing it has reached a stage where if we are talking about fire safety in a building now we have to start looking at the whether the building is secured from the infection point of view so that's something very critical for facility management to take care it's not as much a design factor so while we are discussing the point of having a small area uh, in any given construction now that that would become a buffer space for uh, any kind of visitors who are, who are coming in that vicinity uh, i think i would like to involve mr amin nair to uh, give in his feedback on this how how do we include this buffer space and how can we make this more efficient thank you zin uh, i think before we really get into the physical dimension of how design spatially is going to get done i think it's important to have uh, an understanding of how the pathogen spreads and fortunately or unfortunately this is a very universal pathogen it can come in through me it can come in through you or it can come in through anybody entering the building i believe uh, going forward the most important thing is going to be education and understanding of how it spreads and how i can on a regular basis screen myself to make sure i'm not a carrier because i can be and the second thing is is um, what we are talking to a lot of developers globally uh, calling zones of faith uh, there is a very real fear that the idea of social distancing yeah. is going to end up being um, emotional distancing as well mm. and let's be clear on one thing we are not going to survive as a race if we don't come together businesses will not thrive um cities will not thrive you can then live in the mountains i mean if you have an internet connection theoretically speaking and you want to go and live in the himalayas you're fine right you can do whatever you want to do that's not how businesses are going to run because the guys who are employing us to do that business depend on having I mean, this is an african proverb i do a lot of work in africa and and it who has people around him shall never be poor and uh, and that's really what we need to do we need to have zones of comfort within buildings for example we are all going to start flying in a couple of weeks why do we feel confident that we're going to be able to fly because there are sanitization zones adequately provided knowing that once you've crossed from the red line to the green line everybody around you is also sanitized that is what is going to give you the faith to fly similarly it is going to be for buildings similarly it is going to be for housing similarly it is going to be for schools um i believe um i mean most of us seem to be the age when we would have children either grown up or or at some stage my my children are school going children and they hate online classes they're not going to be happy for the next 5 years listening to stuff on a, on a computer so it's going to be zones of comfort that we need to define and as a professional community we will need to come together architects urban planners transport planners engineers together to start looking at the smallest zone of comfort which could be your house and your lobby and then start going to bigger and bigger zones of comfort and saying the six of us are going to come together and make sure that the building that i work out of has a zone of comfort and 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 sanitization at the entrance and then six sets of people like like the six of us will start looking at a part of delhi a part of gurgaon our colonies our schools that kind of societal impact is really what is going to be needed and there are going to be spaces which are required where these disinfection or what i call the zones of comfort are going to be architectural spaces that don't feel like you're getting into a hospital they have to be designed and planned in a manner where they become a part of our way of doing things that is exactly like what happened after 911 we've gotten used to the idea of being frisked before we take a flight yeah i wasn't frisked uh, you know when i started flying in 1992 93 they would just scan you through a door and that was that but today the frisking can be pretty intrusive especially when you're flying into america or you or or, or uk Uh, but we've gotten used to it and and you keep that time before you fly it's going to be exactly like that for all kinds of interactions so stopping interactions is not the key i think having these zones of comfort is the key and it's not just going to be architects it's going to be urban planners transport planners engineers as i said who will need to come together will it will it make sense to have like this universal format for the zone of comfort and then incorporate it in every given space assume one site will never fit all that is the whole beauty of humanity one size will never ever fit all 
there are n number of intellectuals thinkers people who are tinkering with ideas i saw a couple of beautiful online images uh, on instagram somebody sent me about the restaurants of the future so this guy just took a took a glass um, you know like a light bulb shelf and a, a, a shade and he made that shade the size of a human being with a cut at the back so you you basically sit around a table and enjoy a meal with friends but you're in, in your own little glass bubble so your breath and the other person's doesn't mix it could be a practical idea it may not be i don't know but i think it's going to be millions and millions of of, of creative professionals like us who will come up with these ideas uh, and and there will be trial there will also be errors i mean you look at the case of the uae they opened up about a week back they've gone back, they've gone into restrictions again today so they they tried to do something they failed they're going to try again and maybe they will succeed uh, it's 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 going to be it's going to be lots of people coming together it's a societal issue and there, there's one last thing that i really would like to say on this it's something that we've started doing in our practice for the last one month look at the images on the highways and the roads of the country today these are the people who built the buildings that we designed and i have been part of discussions in conference rooms where people have said look there's an inauguration in a few days we need this labor camp off and that's how we used to always treat them we need this labor camp off we've now started putting scc gcc terms saying that you know even if it is a cost to the project the contractor is going to start insuring uh, 20 uh, 12 months skilling for people so we we are not going to look at a building industry where you have labor reports coming in which say so many skilled so many unskilled and so many semi skilled we're going to look at labor reports that say so many skilled people and so many people who are under training etc so those are the people who will really need to be looked at and that's i think i think the bottom of the of the pyramid is also going to be the boost that gives that that the economy needs not the top of the pyramid okay so i i quickly divert the conversation to now the overall design scenario uh, how is going to change after the lockdown coming to spaces like luxury homes hotels uh, commercial spaces i would like to include uh, sabina and rajiv khanna uh, in this question and and have their feedback on how the spaces are going to change once the uh, lockdown is lifted um thank you azeer um happy to be here with everyone uh uh you are getting to the design specific phases of how they're going to change we all as um, amin has very rightfully said we are in a state of what i you know tend to call as a physical distancing and yet we need to be socially connected emotionally connected as a society that's very important but uh, we do understand that here on there is going to be a new normal one that we'll have to follow as a uh, routine is going to become a part of us now and um, lots of things in terms of hardcore planning as architects is what we will have to design here on in all kinds of building formats whether we are talking of residential commercial offices we still haven't started our office but yes when we're talking about it we're contemplating how to get our team back in you know and likewise how it will work for the larger spaces even for your public urban spaces so there is going to be a different uh, world norm from here on you know and uh, rightfully said as uh, as amin said that it, it's it's going to be uh, you know a lot of trials is happening there's going to be errors because we've never been faced with a situation like this before um so here on our thinking has to be very different um uh, we do need to collaborate across all disciplines it's not just us as architects who can uh, you know uh, design and create those spaces which are healthier happier and most importantly safer from here on so it has to be people across all disciplines engineers and other uh, you know uh, professionals who have to come together to be able to uh, create those healthy spaces where somebody who walks in feels safe enough to be using those spaces so it's a very vast topic if i'm talking about is residential starting with residential starting with the very small houses in which we are not everybody's house was prepped up to work from home situation you know some of us were fortunate enough to be able to work others were not so here on you have to here after in fact you have to think of how homes have to be prepped up and have isolation spaces or have um, small home offices you know where one could work from uh, without disturbing the rest of the family and the children and the elders as you would have and if we're not talking about individual homes and yet in a larger residential communities you know 
maybe you come together in communities and where you have your club spaces, you could create makeshift offices. And those are the spaces where people could use as a community to come down and work from those who cannot work from their individual homes, you know. And of course, likewise, there would be many more for yet to maintain social distancing and your uh, norms of safety that need to be taken into account for sanitization. Coming to offices, when you are in offices, definitely there's going to be an entirely touchless experience is what you're wanting from the time you land in your car till you reach your seat, you know. So there has to be lots of planning uh, uh, perspectives that need to be looked into now, starting from your touchless entry from where you're happening to your sanitization. But prior to that, the offices need to be sanitized, need to have deep cleaning, needs to have been done. HVAC factors need to be taken into account. Uh, spatial designing in terms of uh, circulation, maybe just one way circulation needs to be done. I'm not comfortable sitting in an open office that I was over all these years. I may just want is a partly cubicle space now, you know, rather than where I wanted to uncube earlier. So maybe I still want my see-through, but I want my plexiglass or glass partitions coming into place. So, so we have, so, you know, we would have the need to create barriers, physical barriers, maybe not as much as visual barriers, but yes, for our safety, you know, that is what would need to be done. So maybe having elevators, which are voice controlled, you know, and uh, you uh, just kind of, your, even your staff that comes in for cleaning, your janitorial staff needs to have PPE and, uh, of, of course, going beyond your uh, uh, thermal screening and sanitization at the very start. There's automatic doors happening, sanitization tunnels. I mean, there's dime a dozen examples that will come up, and those design solutions are already underway to prep up offices, you know, when, uh, before the uh, teams move in and the staff moves in. And in spite of all of that, there are going to be lots of offices that will still resort to work from home situation. Not all of them are going to be having their staff back. Maybe you don't want it, you know, 100% of your staff back to work. Why have them commute? You know, so that is uh, lots of thinking and lots of learning that we've had from this, that while work from home has been quite productive, you may not want them all back. You may not want them all on the road. Your meeting rooms, you could, we've been doing Zoom meetings and go to webinars that we are having works well. So there's going to be a whole change in that. So all of those superfluous expenses that we thought of traveling across from Gurgaon to Noida to go and see a site, is going to change. Maybe a 10 site visit that we needed, you know, 10 times over two months, which is rest get restricted to maybe once or twice. Because eventually at the end of the day, architecture is not just about seeing and hearing, it's also about feeling, you know, touch. So you do need to visit sites. You can't entirely discard that, that you can't. Though you could have high-end technologies coming and have drones, you know, that could monitor sites and you can still be sitting at in your home, I mean, in your, you know, at your homes or at your workplaces and choose not to physically be present. You could have robots coming in, but then that all just becomes more capital intensive of how you want to go about it. But those are the kind of things. And yet still maintain physical distancing between, you know, your seats and spaces. There are two, three thoughts that I have, you know, while she's yes. been talking, while listening to everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, one is that we are very fortunate that we have technology at our side at this point of time as a human race. Because it, it makes it much more easier to face the challenge that we are facing. Second is with what is happening this distance we are going to we we are going to enjoy the luxury of space as we call it because the, the moment you have everybody has his own space that's six feet six feet side so you have that uh, 144 square feet of space to yourself as it is said you keep six feet distance from everybody but what happens to the guys who are who we are you know who don't have a roof over their head how we went there, you know, there are eight people, ten people in shanties in Tharvi and other places in the slums all over the country. So that is the challenge, how we are going to look at them, how they are going to come out of this situation, how it is going to go, how are we going to move forward as a nation? So these technologies on our side as we think and uh, we, ha we are empowered and uh, empowering ourselves more and more with technology as we move forward. 
And uh, we have seen what China has done, and we think we will also be at that stage at some point of time. But and the guys who are you know who have the luxury of space will get the luxury of space. But what happens? You know, we every day we see when food packets are being distributed, uh, people need to go to transport to their homes, etc. You have festivals. That is the biggest challenge we are going to face moving forward in the COVID era that as we are in. Yeah, humanity as a calling has also been shaken up, you know, with 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 this um, crisis that I might say, you know, uh, much as we are talking and you're talking about all the physical, the you know, that physical aspect of it, the buildings, how would they be retrofitted, redone? There are so many examples that can be done. I mean, I didn't touch upon HVAC, which is an entire topic in itself. But like Rajiv just pointed out, you know, it is also about the common man, because eventually architecture is all about people and you touch people across all segments, you know. So it's going to affect everybody from the road to the one who's sitting in his AC large office. So, and that yeah, is where all you come together. And I think Ashish is going to, can tell us and guide us a little more that uh, what what do you think about this UV light, uh, uh, you know, concept that is coming through? Is it going to work? How is it going to happen? Take that up. Please, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Right. it's an open discussion. Yeah. Need the permission of the moderator to go ahead with that. So, Rajiv, I think you asked a fantastic question. Uh, it's out of syllabus for the time being, but yeah, I'll still go with that. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, look, UV is the. Uh, uh, if you look at any of the any of the papers or any of the literature going around, UV is the way where you can kill the virus and not about only the corona. All the viruses can easily be handled using the, the UV technology. The challenge so far has been that the what is the strength and the time required uh, to kill this particular virus is not yet known. But if we keep that aside, there are enough corona family viruses which are still around from where the analogy can be drawn and you can look at that. That's fine. So it comes down when you want to kill a virus, it comes down to a function of time and a function of intensity of the UV that we are using. For a healthcare application, for a hospital, uh, doing those kind of things, what we call a, a, a upper room UV GIs and all, are all that possible. But coming down to offices where I've been hearing crazy stuff, uh, which people are claiming or which they claim to be doing that uh, I'll put a, I heard one of the webinars that I was on, client said, I'm going to put UV lamp in my office. I'm going to replace all the tube lights or some of the tube lights with UV lamps. And in the nighttime when people are gone, the UV will be switched on. It will disinfect the place. And next day morning when I'll come, my place is disinfect. You know, I'm hearing things like those. But are those the solutions? Possibly no. I think what we are forgetting at the end of the day, that prime cause for spread of the corona and COVID that we're talking of here is the contact with the droplets. Uh, the droplets which come out during the cough and the sneezing and and social distancing for the time being uh, in terms of covering your mouth or having your hands covered what uh, amin has got is the way to go and all of these uvs and all are secondary protection around you we can't make our offices into a into a uh, in a hospital zone i don't think that'll work plus please also remember the uv is ultimately detrimental to human health if there's a direct contact that you do that. In fact, I heard one of those also that I have a UV lamp on my head and I'll I'll be sitting underneath that. Now I said, of course, that's not possible. You're going to get burnt out. You get, you get eye damage. So I think the reactions are to the extreme. Somebody told me a story. They said, uh, I've not named the person, but uh, he said he came across a, 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 a client of his who had a small pendant on him. He said, what is this pendant for? He says, this pendant is generating ozone and making sure everything around me is getting killed. So, I don't know the, the, where we are going because ozone itself is, is detrimental to human health. But having said that, uh, there is, uh, please remember that UV has been shown as the most promising thing. In fact, one of the webinars again, that I attended, and it did talk about a concept called far UVC. Far UVC is a low... Wavelength. Sorry, I mean I'm getting into a little bit. Uh, Aziz, sorry, I'm getting a little bit more longer. But far UVC, where they say it's a shorter wavelength UV, 
and what it does is that it doesn't penetrate the human skin uh, it was it was discovered about 10 years back but it never took forward because there was no need for for having a uv in our daily life so that's the area where people are going to look at and for all you know future could be that you as amin said that you walk into a sanitized zone so you'll have a, a uv tunnel of far uv in which you walk through that on the side when you come out you are a you are a sanitized person and then you're working inside don't be surprised if, if this is a lifestyle you might get into at some point of time so yeah i won't go long because i can go on the subject for one hour i give lectures on it so, so I, i would need you to go on a different subject now and well, uh, let's talk about hvac because that is another massive exercise that that goes into creating a building so it would tell us how how will this change down the line will it change at all is, is the first question so you are uh, i think there's enough which is said there are enough guidelines from societies like ashre which is the american society of air conditioning engineers and ishre which is there and there's a lot of misinformation in the system also that you stay indoors and you're going to get infected by the air condition through the air conditioning system those are all the misconceptions which are around primarily the the prime source of transmission remains the larger droplets which fall on the surfaces and you need to do the sanitation bit to it so keeping that out coming on to the hvac part since your question is very specific there are four lines of defenses which have been said and you will see that going forward in your building the first is the temperature range as the temperature is more and more elevated the activity level of the of the corona since we are talking with respect to that starts coming down so the prescribed temperatures people are looking at is anything about 24 onwards 25 26 27 what are you like to do the second aspect is the relative humidity at a drier at a at a drier uh, uh, humidity conditions the transmission becomes faster because your own body uh, defense mechanism the mucus membranes that you have do not function there so a uh, relative humidity which is higher something on 50% to 60 70% side would 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 be something talked about the third which is the which is the is the topmost defense is the ventilation that means the dilution of the air inside so the fresh air which the in hotels people used to close them because otherwise the, the the electricity bill will go up or people are not worried about it you have so many of the buildings office building they put a vrf for a window ac or a split ac system and they don't have the fresh air system so fresh air will come in and the fourth part is filtration a better filtration is what will be required now fortunately if you if you relate and as is that's important if you relate the green building movement to it the green buildings always spoke about these four aspects in their in their indoor environmental quality section all these four aspects are covered so i was talking to some of my counterparts in america they said in india you guys are very lucky because your buildings when they came up from from 90 from 2010 onwards sorry from 2000 1990 uh later 1990s and early 2000 when we came up there you all went into green building movement in fact a lot of your modern buildings the large complexes there they are green buildings where they're following certain norms of the fresh air certain norms of temperature some certain norms of relative humidity certain norms of indoor environmental quality whereas in the developed world they did not have that uh, that luxury so their filtration levels are so poor and they are talking about upgrading to filtration levels whereas our modern buildings do carry those filtration levels thanks to the green building movement so that's been a very interesting discussion that we have had again i can go on let's move on okay uh, i would like to involve mr vijay tuteja now to discuss uh, will this covid scenario affect the building material industry in any way uh, what kind of materials Uh, do you think will make more sense here on, and what will be difficult to source and difficult to use uh, after the lockdown? I think it has affected the supply of building material. It's going to do that. Traditionally, the month of March, April, May, the default materials which we have in our building industry, mainly uh, burn bricks, we have coarse sand, we have fine sand, and we have uh, coarse aggregate for uh, making uh, concrete now these are the materials which get affected by the rain so there's all that lot of stacking happens for the material much before uh, 15th of june on all lot projects because once the monsoon sets in you don't get any good quality bricks or whatever has been stacked sells at a higher price that's the reason why the material gets stacked 
so that lead period which people had has been lost at the same time the businesses have also lost considerable amount of money because they didn't made breaks or uh, made money on the material they would have sold otherwise and now we are by the time all these sites get uh, started again we will be somewhere in the end of june the monsoons would have set in the quality of uh, aggregate fine sand and everything will further deteriorate because the sale factor goes up. So with the result that the quality issues at site becomes a major issue, apart from the cost because the demand supply will always ba balance out. Cement price has already gone up for no reasons. In fact, uh, the cement prices have got no reasons to go up because there's this stacking time because for two months, no cement was used and the cement would have gone stale because it has shelf life or whatever but still the cement price has gone up and similarly the other building material will go up but at the will, same will the, time when we talk about pricing go up because of this pardon will real yes, estate to some... also go up? no they they won't they can't absorb these kind of costs because uh, the pricing which the real estate is now having is virtually uh, their profit margin is maybe about 6 to 7% and there's no room for absorbing it. So that's where the challenges are. Furthermore, uh, when we talk about uh, these materials, in terms of finishing materials, there are a lot of materials which we get from China, stainless steel, you name anything in the building industry, half of it comes from there for pricing reasons. So that mm -hmm. will also get kind of a factored in because the rupee has devalued in the meantime, plus, the imports are not going to be that easy. Uh, so with the result that we reckon that there'll be another 10 to 15% inflation on those kind of materials also. Then the other factor is that uh, if the staff which the real estate companies have, if they had a lean period and they didn't work, their overheads have gone up. So that also affects the kind of pricing, the, the basic cost of the unit, but they're not able to recover that. So with the result that it will be in their own interest to finish the building much faster than they thought they would. So in terms of time delays and all, I don't foresee that it will go more than four or five months, but it will have some impact there also. But moving forward, what has happened, the kind of labor movement which we have seen going back will push the aluminum shuttering to the front because there were a lot of people who were shying away because of the initial cost of the shuttering. But now I think we'll see more of uh, shuttering and doing buildings in concrete, where then we will avoid double handling or triple handling of building materials. Like if you have a conventional concrete beam structure, you have first bricks to go in and then you plaster it, then you do POP and then you do the painting. But if you do it in aluminum shuttering, you are just doing it in one go and you save about one to one and a half years of time by just doing that abortive mm. works. Moving forward, I think that will become a kind of a standard. So that's another factor which I think uh, the designers and the architects need to take into account that if they're going towards the aluminum shuttering, they need to freeze the design with their clients. It affects the floor area also because the walls are gonna be slightly thicker than what they are otherwise in a brick structure. Maybe you're talking about 100 or 115, either in bricks or fly ash. So all those factors will then start getting back onto the drawing board at the initial stages so that a design gets evolved and that's how the construction industry will proceed. Uh, Mr. Amin, we'll, we'll go a little off design now and talk about the economy of the country. Uh, as we know that, that the current scenario is not very bright, we, we uh, are not doing very good when it comes to the economy of the country. Uh, how in the near future will this will this recover anyhow? And if yes, then what steps do we need to take with respect to the real estate or design to uh, reach that space? So it's a uh, so let me answer one question straight off. It will recover. Whatever has happened is an artificial stoppage of business. It's not like I don't want to build a house now. It's not like you don't want to go on a holiday. It's, it's an artificial business and it will recover. 
from a from the standpoint of the real estate industry there is something very interesting and and you know a lot of times when we speak about things on these lines, there's no answer that people have so across the board when you talk to real estate industry professionals and say well there's a crisis there's a material problem labor has gone away do you think that the price of buildings is going to rise the general answer is yes it will mm. i have a counter question is anybody asking that to the vehicle industry guys the economy is going through a bad time is the cost of vehicles going to rise the answer is no cost of vehicles is not going to rise let me give you another example an entry level car 15 years ago used to cost exactly the same in indian rupees that it does today in the range of 2 and 1/2 to 3 lakh rupees at that point of time the suspensions weren't so good there was no smart entertainment system you have to put your own audio system later on no power windows and the ac used to be very iffy 10 years up the suspension is better the ac is better it comes with a smartphone compliant audio system still costs the same 10 years ago the house that i constructed costed different from what i'm doing today i think it is an opportunity for smart intellectuals to come in and say guys we need to look at a paradigm shift in the way building performance is measured longevity of buildings is measured the weight of buildings is measured india is a, is largely a seismic country at least 3 or 4 in most of the area zones in certain cases 5 uh, why are we not looking at reengineering and lighter buildings um upskilling we call it the construction industry there is very little industry in it actually so you know as mr tuteja rightly said if you wanted yourself a swanky building you went to china mm-hmm. i have been part of projects where so, you know we'll go for a shopping trip to china we'll buy we'll buy this we'll buy that we'll buy that whether eight containers they'll come in two months we'll fit it up and it's all done that used to be the supply chain today we have mm-hmm. the opportunity of looking at alternative supply chains building our own and getting into this design system so the economic demand will be there it is not that the demand is gone away yeah there's going to be a hiccup there's going to be a problem it's going to have some amount of break people are afraid and a lot of fear also comes from the fact that we're going to have to relook things you know you can't just tomorrow morning open a hotel and say we're open for business you need to get the patrons to feel comfortable about it that you know whoever slept in that bed last night i've cleaned it up and you can come and sleep in it there's no problem those things will take a little bit of time but i believe that they offer a massive opportunity a huge upside to the entire building industry to get its act together and and really move up the value chain we have consistently been moving down the value chain consistently been moving down the value chain we've become almost commoditized even from the intellectual fee i mean nobody does competitive fee bidding for lawyers i'm not aware of it or doctors but we do it for architects even engineers i mean consulting engineers quote a fee and give a give a you know give a what is it called there's a government term for it uh, earnest money deposit emd so there's something you know something something is unhinged something is un, you know something is broken and i think opportunities like this and i'm deliberately using this word it's an opportunity we've got the time we're sitting here and talking about it intellectuals are coming to it i didn't know mr tuteja a week back i didn't know the other people on the panel a week back today i suddenly know five four five other intellectual people who are thinking i can i can pick their brains they can pick mine and we can come up with a solution this is i think an incredible opportunity incredible opportunity for growth and business for those people who focus in the right direction and have the staying power for the next six months right. uh, can i i mean just to support your point you're talking about opportunities i think it's the scale which will determine there is one level where i don't think we'll have any choice but to go to most probably china and get this for instance just the lifts alone if you are looking for one second uh, one meter per second lift nobody manufactures them here you still have to go to china because of the scale and how many buildings are we doing in india which require those kind of lifts every year maybe 100 200 towers or maybe 500 towers and nobody will come and put up a plant as an opportunity but i think the opportunities are there at a much smaller level just to give an example for the about the commonwealth games time the jindal steel put up all these kind of nice tns steel bus stands all over delhi it was a treat to see the kind of uh, good work they had done it was a high quality steel they had produced if you go to the shopping malls every mall has got these fancy stainless steel railing which comes from china why can't we do that in india so just to talk about that scale i think there's a huge opportunity in the building industry that people should now be looking at a kind of proprietary type of 
activities to kind of get into and develop those kind of niche areas rather than just inventing because everybody is going for a turnkey solution where they're just trying in-house capabilities to produce a result. I think they have to go one point beyond and now start specializing in certain areas and say that, okay, this is what we do and we will do it with a passion and a good quality work. So I think while, the time has come that in the direction. While we are at discussing importing technology and technological advancements in the real estate and architectural industry, uh, I would like to divert the attention to 3D printing as well in, in real estate and in architecture. Now that we are having this shortage of labor, uh, will will 3D printing somewhere be the next big thing? I would like to divert this to uh, Rajiv and Sabina. I think uh, technology-wise, 3D printing has got limitations in the building industry and uh, because of the rigs that you need to fabricate along with it. But yes, there is a lot of scope for development and it's going to take some time not in the near future because different people in uh, europe and china have tried different things mm. but it's the technology is there but it's in the future maybe it will get uh, yeah i mean you want to say something uh, no please I'll, I'll come in once you finish no i don't want to interrupt <laughs> I <think too. laughs> that's it for, that's what i wanted to say that it's like a little futuristic right now can not I, in the near in? yeah, yeah please. Of as is we don't have a shortage of labor we don't absolutely have a shortage of labor we have a surplus of labor let me again take you back to the late 90s when when we opened up our economy we actually had a very very low tech start to our it business there was something called a bpo movement that started business process outsourcing these were undergraduates class 12th pass people who could speak english who were brought into these office to answer calls for business processes that's where it started really but you look at the way that industry treated them. Cars would go home, pick them up, drop them. They had swanky canteens where they could eat. What were they doing? Low tech jobs, right? I mean, these guys were on a phone call saying, yes, sir, no, sir, please click alt right and you're fine. That's what they were doing. But the industry treated them well and the industry grew from there to what it is today. I mean, to a, to a point where we are scarily dependent on industrial uh, on, on non-industrial output and service output for our gdp it's about half of it now almost we need to treat those people right we need to understand what trainings they need what skill upgradation is required and what tools to put into their hands that they would actually do the job the way it's supposed to be done rather than have the lowest tech possible tools in their hands and they go about mucking things up mm. i think it needs to be a it needs to be a fundamental change i don't think 3d printing is going to come and save us our roads are not going to be 3D printed, our bridges are not going to be 3D printed, mass housing is not going to be at any point of time 3D printed anytime soon. Those mm. compounds simply don't exist. We have labor, we need to train them, put the right tools in their hand, and that's like I said, a massive upside of opportunity. Massive upside of opportunity. Mr. Ashish, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I do want to say something here. Uh, on one side, I do I mean, agree with Amin, but on the other side, uh, I do want to put a point. You know, it's not about just 3D printing. There are many technologies out there which India can benefit from, our design community can benefit from, be it the architects or the engineers, it doesn't matter. In my personal opinion, these technologies will take much longer time in India to get implemented because our businesses, whether it's architecture, engineering, are not viable. The way we are doing business, and I mean, touch, did touch on it, the way our, our, our uh, the fee are and uh, uh, the way we code, the way we do business, those are unsustainable ways. And that leaves very little pocket in your money. Uh, we are working on margins which, are, which, which any businessman would tell you is not even worth doing. What are you doing? What are you guys wasting your time for? And if you don't have money, your investment into the technology gets affected with that i would like to put much much more in my organization but why should, if i have to just keep doing it from my pocket and it's not sustainable it doesn't make sense so in my personal opinion it's uh whether 3d printing and all they've all been around for a long time and many such technologies i don't want to single out the 3d printing alone have taken their own sweet time or will take their own sweet time to get implemented because of these unsustainable practices that we are 
any other technologies that that we want to touch point on that that we think that will come in post covid sami well one of the technologies that's been sort of knocking on our doors and 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 has a huge uh, potential is the use of bim uh it's 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 become more popular in the last few years but it's got miles and miles and miles to go before it before it, it becomes completely uh, completely enmeshed uh, it allows for uh, offline communication it allows for coordination it allows for different people working in work groups distantly not having to meet it reduces the amount of man hours required by multiple experts and subject matter experts to come in and finish up part of the building it avoids confusions you don't have to be an expert at reading drawings to be able to understand what the building is about it's in 3d i think there is um, there is this is now a very good time to explore um, you know in ifc portals for india indian manufacturers materials that we do our own is standards to be used instead of everything being on stm etc i think those are also that's that's a technology that's already on our doorstep a lot of people use it and i think it has um, it has tremendous potential now to grow exponentially what is the technology called again bim okay. building information okay uh, this is uh, this is fundamentally parametric modeling of all building components prior to mm. construction uh, so you know it, it's like virtually constructing a building on your server before you actually mm. go to the site uh, we we moved to it in 2015 it's been it was uphill i'm not going to joke about it but uh, but the the payoffs have been huge i mean we we don't need to be in every country or every geography that we now work in we have a single office and we are working in multiple geographies uh, and doing it reasonably successfully on account of the fact that the communication is very clear and um, and a lot of problems and i think the seasoned professionals sitting around the table here um, would would accept that a lot of meetings and discussions and issues that come up on site are about missed opportunities on communication and nothing else i didn't look at it i didn't see it i didn't know it was in clause number 4b and that's why i didn't do it etc but uh, this technology offers massive amounts of of collaborative power for very little computing power now it used to require a lot of computing power earlier even that has come down you can put it on the cloud there is there is a huge amount of collaboration between different different subject matter experts possible what ashish mentioned about the viability of business it's about the output per hour all of those things i think uh, have a potential of being looked at now mm -hmm. Okay, so we discuss at length about now the future after the lockdown. Uh, let's talk about what is happening right now with the existing projects, and uh, when do we intend to see movement again with respect to uh, completion of projects? I would like to involve uh, Sabina in this and uh, get her views on it. Uh, well, uh, projects uh, online on site have of course all been affected because much as we've seen all of it, everything came to a standstill in a time so unprecedented and unexpected. Labor had to leave, could not mm. be on site, physical distancing to be maintained. Everything came to a standstill, you know. So without a doubt, yes, projects are delayed. That has, that, that, that has uh, you know, that's what we've seen over the last few months. And mm. this is going to have, a, have an effect, have a longer effect, you know, if it's was shut for about a couple of months is going to have a much uh, longer impact on when the work is going to revive and deliveries of the projects are definitely going to be impacted. Also, it's going to depend upon the size and the typology of the project, you know, of how soon is the project going to revive? Uh, is the team coming back in batches? Can, is there, you know, what are the options? Um, can one, can one start the project with maybe local labor and not wait for the labor that has actually gone back home and mm -hmm. wait for them to come. So how soon can a project uh, get started? So I just feel maybe that there might just be an impetus of more of having a local labor to begin on with projects. Projects mid-size may begin where labor can just come in and get going. And uh, of course, this is for the projects that is happening, you know, that are currently underway. The projects mm -hmm. have been impacted. Our projects have been impacted, though now we have been getting calls. We are, we, are, we, are, we are working for developers, and now we are getting actually messages that work has started on site. And just in case if you do need to visit the site, you're most welcome. Our engineer is there. Our, partly our teams are there. So work is coming back on site. It's coming alive, you know. 
on site so of course with all the all the uh, health norms and uh, everything will have to be maintained and uh, this is more so for the existing but here i'd just like to add is that probably from here on for newer projects also there will be i assume a changed mindset you know when we might like what i mean mentioned be doing more on our computers and in the studios and so that we have you know less labor intensive projects happening on site so we're going in for more of prefab projects coming in so that everything is coming in from the factories and it's just being installed so you don't have as much of as much labor on site you know so it's it's going to impact the newer projects as well okay i think we are a bit short on time we have reached uh, for 53 so we have about 5 7 minutes left yes, uh, and i just like to add a line here we yeah. all saw how china built those hospitals in 10 days 15 days though they were single floor they were industrial in nature they were all prefab they were all brought in trailer trucks and they were all mechanized everything was mechanized we are going to see a lot of that happening as we move forward so so yeah. so now I, i would like everyone to give their thoughts on one good thing that the pandemic has done uh, on a more personal note starting with mr vijay tripeja i think what this period has uh, done to the industry is that a we will be able to work remotely with uh, virtual meetings so that was one big uh, take away from this period like we successfully uh, catered to all our sites uh, because all our sites started about 3 weeks back uh, so that was the advantage uh, while the uh, <clears throat> delhi got open today but the uh, sites in haryana as well as in bhubaneswar started 3 weeks back so with the result that we were able to get at all problems solved and that was one big take we had from here and the other thing is we still need to kind of uh, innovate to the extent what we were doing earlier we will be still looking for value engineering the labor uh, issue is now going to become a major issue though we didn't see the labor issue as to the extent which the press was showing the media was showing historically this is the kind of a period when the labor goes back this time it was a forced kind of a situation on them we are still trying to assess whether is the labor part which is going to come back first or the skilled artisan or the semi skilled artisan mm -hmm. the labor doesn't really affect the site movement but the progress of site depends on the skill and the semi skilled artisans in every field so that's something which we still need to assess but uh, <clears throat> overall i think it was a kind of a setback to the real estate real estate industry that lot of cost went in without getting any uh, fruitful results from it Okay. Uh, moving to Mr. Ashish, one good thing that the pandemic has uh, brought to the industry. So, as is uh, with respect to, of course, leaving our personal lives behind. So, what we got with our family, I think, leave that behind. But from a business perspective, uh, I think the the what I mean also mentioned earlier, this aspect of of remote working. Uh, especially with respect to designers now i'm sure most of the designers in this time has been quite busy and what the other uh part of the industry has felt let's say from a contracting to a uh, shopkeepers to a lot of others the we haven't seen that kind of effect on our business because we could we could design remotely we could still work remotely of course with respect to efficiency coordination those are those are issues which can get resolved over a period of time uh but the good part that emerged is that yes the work can be done remotely as far as the design is concerned uh we do need to go to site but that mad running we were doing you know once i had a bet i started from gurgaon and uh, so there was a there was a uh, client of ours was starting from gurugram and i was starting from mumbai and we had a bet who will land first whether i'll reach noida first or he'll reach noida first and actually we reached nearly at the same time i came from mumbai in one and a half hours and another 45 minutes i could reach there and he came up come out of gurugram to about an hour so that mad thing that we have had and today many of our clients were completely non believers in doing the electronic medium are, are 
are agreeing to it. They say, let's get on the call, let's finish that. Of course, there's an excess of it also, but still we are saving so much of time. I think I see this yeah. learning which has come out as a one big thing for a design community. And I agree with Amin that this can has a potential of bringing us back into the profitable zone because our time will get better utilized hopefully going mm -hmm. forward mm -hmm. and respect is coming. Yes. Sami, do you want to add something to that? No, I think I have a general agreement with, with what everybody has said. I think the big thing is that people, when, when people get pushed, um, the fear of not being able to survive makes us also accept new things. Mm -hmm. And the fact that a large number of people, and, and I would call it almost a tipping point for our industry, is willing to open up their minds and think of alternatives. Just accept that there is a conversation that can happen along alternatives. I think is the single biggest takeaway from this from this disaster. Sabina and Rajiv Panna. Yeah, if I can just add, I'll just I'll just um, answer this a little differently. Maybe not from an architect or a professional point of view, which all my colleagues have answered. I'll just take it more from a humane aspect, you know, of what uh, every crisis and every calamity that comes, you know, it usually goes. I mean, I mean, whatever it goes away, we already, you know, we always have learnings and takeaways from that. So what I say that it has basically taught us, taught all of us is a respect for nature. We've learned to value nature and understand that we learn to live it. I'm not even saying live with it. We've learned to live it and actually not abuse it. So that is the thing that all of us have taught, I mean, have learned during this time. So the integration of nature here on, even also as architects, when we're talking about redesigning, repurposing our buildings, I would rather say is to integrate nature into that, you know, which is very important. Go into biophilic design, go into use use nature to make your spaces more healthier, you know, give give nature that respect that it should have. And that has been uh, been uh, quite a, you know, an awakening call for all of us. And also is a respect for humanity that, that has come out. You know, we've, started, we've learned to value each other. We've learned, even while all of us are locked up in our own homes in isolation, we, we learned to, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that uh, there was strength in all of us being together. Even though we were not physically together, we, we you know, so we've learned to value each other and we've actually connected more so with each other, even, you know, in these times. Even those things which, uh, which uh, may have uh, different... Uh, viewpoint from everybody of even lighting a candle together on one particular time or even clapping your hands, it actually brought us all together and actually we all gained strength from, so you know, from, uh, from, uh, uh, from things like that that happened. And thirdly, I would say, now coming from an architect's point is, we have learned how to now here on is design with purpose. We want to do away with, probably do away with more of superfluous, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of things and just kind of plan with, with with purpose now, do away with meaningless aesthetics and other things, you know, and we would just from here on just want to do everything with a purpose. And that has been a different learning apart from, of course, learn to work remotely and live sustainably and create agile environments, be more adaptive. All of that is part of it that comes in the package. That would stay with us permanently. That is one thing that would stay with us. <laughs> Rajiv, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, what I have learned is, you know, it's a very, it's three words only, but it's got a very wide meaning. So I leave you, leave you to think about it. Less is more. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> yeah, we have to live minimally and restricted. If you look at it from any sphere of life, less is more. So true. That's a very good saying in architecture. And it makes more relevance today than ever before. <laughs> yes. oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think we have we have a question from the audience. Will green building parameters increase in building design? What will happen? I think uh, uh, Mr. Ashish could answer this. Uh, as I said earlier, look if you look at the fundamentals of the green building, uh, that's something which are just getting strengthened here uh, in the whole. COVID scenario, the indoor environmental quality that we used to, uh, the, the, the green buildings do talk about, is something which is, uh, which are the basic parameter or basic uh, tools for fighting this, this, this pandemic in a conditioned building, in an enclosed building. Number two, even if you look at from a water perspective, 
we spoke about a good quality water the water being uh, safe a certain sort of hygiene standards to be to be maintained and the same thing has been shown that in the, the transmission of a of a disease through water or this particular disease to water very low because of the if in case you are doing the treatment on of it you are following that similarly on the materials part that you use the ones with the low vocs you are not generating aerosols and aerosols are also been regarded as one of the carriers for this for this uh, virus so the fundamentals of the green buildings are just fortified here and uh, they'll be followed there's something else which is happening in this there is a uh, uh, another rating system which the or rather not a type of building we we'll talk about health and well being the wellness part of it so that's again that's going to become important i do see as uh, being part of the indian green building council and the executive committee we did have a debate a meeting of our uh, of our covid task force we we talked about our rating systems getting into uh, into addressing these issues more strongly so yes the the green building parameters uh, will increase in building design the green building parameter itself will evolve to start covering more healthier buildings so it will start seeing that so there is a talk and discussion happening in that area okay there is one more question uh, that says what will happen to the travel industry what changes it will undergo to get back to on track uh, none of us are travel experts over here but if anyone wants to take that question maybe just space i just hope that it gets back to normal as soon as possible because we are all die hard travelers <laughs> you know as architects and all of us love travel it will it will definitely again undergo changes as anything else that has been impacted you know but it has to get back rolling and on its wheels mm -hmm. um, there's a very interesting thing happening globally uh, for the first time in many many years inter country cooperation on economics and industry and trade is happening on the basis of human safety it's not about who sells what cheaper so if today one of us wanted to travel to the uk the uk government and the indian government need to have an agreement that an indian health pass is going to be valid in uk and you're not going to put the traveler in a 14 day quarantine when he lands at heathrow mm -hmm. and this is going to happen across the globe travel is not going to start unless the health pass system is implemented and your port of departure and the port of arrival both respected and i believe that that is going to open up a huge amount of interactions between countries because obviously the drivers would be economy and trade but the basis would be human safety okay we have one it's a very interesting question actually this let's keep this as the last question because i think we are running out of time uh, this guy says that the environment has improved a lot now when everything changes they will get affected once again so what solution what precautions do we keep at hand ready and how architects can influence these things so that we don't go back to the polluted uh, mad crazy population that we were i think to be able to still still retain uh, the environment that we are seeing now as the blue skies and everything it is yes. not just for architects it for it's for us humanity across the board to remain sane even in times when everything opens up and mm. actually taking those learnings that we've had during this this period of lockdown you know and not just undo everything that has been done during this time but as architects there is a lot of design uh, that encourages certain behavior that is implemented at at the conceptual level so anything in specific to that aspect that we can maybe incorporate from here on in design in projects where we make sure that we retain certain uh, aspects of the current scenario two more questions i think they would be done in any case i mean you know uh, the reasonable logical thinking and planning that is done yes we would have we've had more learnings you know which would now be done and uh, maintained for all projects no all of us have become all of us have become more sensitive to the environment as uh, in these last two months and as uh, all seminars and discussions that we have been having it everybody everybody has become more sensitive to the environment and to consumption and everybody is looking at you know uh, 
consuming less in terms of uh, not human consumption as such, but building materials. Looking at different alternatives to how to construct buildings faster. Travel to avoid superfluous travel. You know, you're reducing carbon footprints. Uh, I think I think it's just going to be the general way of living here on. You know, which is going to change. And uh, we first aid professionals who um, can think. Of, you know, can yeah. Go ahead, Ashish. No, no. Finish. I was just giving a signal to Aziz that I like to speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I just feel that we, as uh, we, 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 as the creative industry, you know, will definitely rise to this occasion, and as we've always been doing, you know, but more so, there has, there will be a contribution across the board from people in general, also. Hmm. Yeah, Can I add something here. Oh, this one, sorry. Please, you want to go ahead? Please do that. Basically, what I was saying was that whatever has. Uh, been gained in the environment i think we need to preserve that and like they say charity begins at home so i think everybody needs to now spend more time with the family not travel unnecessarily on the road over the weekends or whatever and preserve mm -hmm. the environment as much as we can and i think that will create a kind of a requirement for all these people to then have outlets for entertainment for uh, going for a drive or having facilities where they can entertain the family which is lacking at I this point in time very few so i think the requirement has to get generated from here from the gains we have already got in the society i think not I think one thing I, think I, want to add there. I want to add there on the yes, water part the of it. On so if you see this mm -hmm. this duration of lockdown has shown us that the whatever the problems that we are having in our water sources uh in terms of the 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 not so clean water which used to be there in our rivers it has vanished it's it's a, it's a clean water now the human population is still the same we are still discharging the same sewer into the into our rivers but our rivers are able to cope up with it the problem that is there is elsewhere and that is what now is clearly coming out i don't need to spell it out we all understand that I think government should make a note and the and the owners should make a note. It's easy for us to now address that water problem because we have been we have been attacking elsewhere all the time. Hmm. How can we address that? You can talk to Ashish on the side. I would like to talk to you about that. <laughs> There is, there is actually a lot of politics that is also involved in these issues, so it's not as simple as this. Bring back the politics and the, the blue skies are gone. So let's talk about how we rise above the politics and do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we ourselves have to get into politics for that. Yeah. Okay, so we'll take one last question that is uh, uh, this guy asks, will design include more open spaces like terrace flats, huge balconies? Because we need to have more spacious areas for the social distancing. So, I mean, you want to take this? I. It's always nice to have open spaces, but I think there's a little bit of a confusion. Uh, there is no social distancing within families, so I don't think that is going to be really a trigger for having open spaces in houses. But uh, we spoke about zones of confidence and zones of safety in our urban areas. Mm. Um, Yes, I think uh, I think incorporation of of green urban natural spaces or even semi-designed urban open spaces uh, needs to become a priority so that so that the people who today uh, find the city alien and and because they live in smaller houses they have nowhere else to go to and they want to go back to the village the, the, the city actually has enough space enough social space for mm -hmm. them to be able to have a relaxing time and and, and it's part of urban design and, and again a little bit of politics as well. But yes, I think it would it would be impacted, and and people would appreciate it a whole lot more now than earlier, especially if the air remains cleaner. Okay, okay, I think brings us to the end of the discussion. Uh, if there is anything Gautam can probably message you. Okay, so we we'll wrap this up. Uh, I would like to thank all the esteemed panelists that have been taking out time for this session. Uh, Thank you, Ashish Akeja, Rajiv Khanna, Sabina Khanna, Amin Nayak. Thank you, Vijay Kuteja. 
thank you alu decor for organizing this session for us and the audience for being there with us throughout thank you everyone uh, we hope to see you in the next discussion soon thank you so much thank you eminent guests and panelists and thank you all the audience who have joined in i hope we all have received good information good insights and we should be taking home a lot of information and insight uh, after this session we hope to keep you updated we hope to keep you knowledgeable thank you stay safe take care if one bye thing bye. that everyone should take out from this discussion bye bye. i would say bye. not to travel unnecessarily was hitting the nail on the head that is something that we should uh, try to try to keep as a daily uh, thing from your own yes thank you amin thank you alis thank you thank you, thank you guys care. thank you nice sharing the platform with you take care Bye.